Okay, awesome. So hello, it's nice to see everyone. Obviously it's my first time here and I've come up from the South Coast, so not often up in Manchester at this time of year. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Sussex and I'll be presenting some of the work we've been doing. So this might be a slightly different pace to some of the other presentations that you've seen, but as you see, it's named On the Temporal Behavior for Large-Scale Microservice Architecture. So I'm not going to go into too much detail because obviously people talk about microservices all the time, but microservices is an architectural approach that composes an application as a collection of loosely coupled uh, fine-grained services. So you might have something like a shopfront application uh, that is supported by five backend microservices and you know, your user requests pass these microservices and it's the communication between these microservices that supply the functionality of your application. Now, one of the things that is talked about a decent amount or at least the words thrown around, uh, complexity in microservice architectures, um, obviously, either you're refactoring from a monolithic architecture that's already fairly complex, or you're evolving the functionality of your architecture over time, and this means adding new microservices and new interactions to your architecture. And what this sort of eventually evolves to, depending obviously on the scale of your company, is something like Uber has here in their blog from 2020, where you have a load of microservices, a load of interactions, and it becomes very hard to sort of hold this sort of information in your mind as to what's going on. And this is sort of the sticking point that's raised is microservice complexity. Now, uh, on top of that, there's something that's less explored, especially in academia, where I come from. And this is the sort of runtime complex behavior of microservice architectures. Now, what exactly do I mean by the behavior of microservice architecture? Well, you could probably characterize this in many different ways, right? So we could talk about CPU usage, response times, etc. cetera. Um, but we look in our work at the dependency structure of these architectures. So when you talk about the dependencies, you can talk about the static dependencies. So these are your sort of uh, static code analysis. You see all of the possible calls that could be made between your microservices anytime. And this is sort of a, you can see as a superposition view of the behavior of the system. So this is like all of the possible behaviors that could ever happen. Uh, during the running of your uh, Microsoft architecture. The other one is the runtime dependencies, or probably more specifically, the actual calls and communication between your microservices in production, in runtime, uh, for your system. And obviously, when we're talking about the temporal behavior of our system, we're a lot more interested in these runtime dependencies. So this sort of led us to a research question, which was, you know, how variable are the system-wide dependencies of a large-scale Microsoft architecture at runtime? Um, and to sort of investigate this question, we use the incredibly helpful Alibaba cluster data set, or more specifically, the Microservice 2021 data set. So fairly recent in time, I guess, two years, a lot of things can happen. But this is a data set that contains the metrics collected from uh, the microservices running on one of their production clusters, supporting obviously their vast array of front-end services. So this is about 90,000 different instances, of 1,300 different types of microservices running on about 13,000 different bare metal nodes. So it's fairly large. Um, the metrics are only collected over 12 hours of operation, uh, which is not great, uh, but in academia, we always take any data we can get. So this is sort of just something we have to make do with. Um, the most powerful thing about this data set is they uh, supply us with the distributed tracing data for essentially the call spans between the microservices based on the user requests over the 12 hours. So these are essentially the uh, runtime dependencies that I was talking about on the previous slide. So how we actually sort of interrogated these calls in terms of the behavior of the system? Well, we time windowed the entire 12 hours into one minute windows, and then we aggregate the massive amounts of calls that are made per one minute into sort of static snapshots. So these are networks where an edge between nodes uh, directed edge between nodes indicates the one microservice called another at least once within that one minute window. And then to sort of investigate the variability of the behavior, uh, we looked at the structural distance between these snapshots in a pairwise manner. So we end up with a 720 by 720 matrix of essentially the distance between all of these, or actually similarity, so one minor the distance, but same thing. Um, and this got us results like this not to sort of shock you with some uh, figures out of nowhere, but the uh, similarity matrix is on your left, I guess, my right. Um, and what you can see is that we can indeed observe a decent amount of variability in the behavior based on the calls being made of the microservice architecture over just the 12 hours. 
you can sort of pick out um, two sort of broad periods where there seems to be persistent structure in the calls being made. So it seems that the call patterns of the microservice uh, architecture are fairly consistent. So from zero to 520 minutes, and then from 520 to the end. So these are labeled as S1 and S2. But another interesting thing you can see is sort of two slash three more transient periods of you know, a fluctuation in the structure of the microservice architecture. Um, and these are interesting because they show a decent amount of dissimilarity to the two S1 and S2 periods, but they show somewhat increased similarity to each other, which is interesting. Um, and what the figure is on the left, or your right, is uh, a projection into lower dimensional space of these distances. And we can see, again, we can group S1 and S2 into sort of clusters of similar structural features. And then this S3 uh, grouping, which is slightly more um, dispersed, is the clustering of the transient, the sort of shorter periods that you saw on there that are more dissimilar to the rest of the periods. Um, so this seems to suggest that these aren't just deviations from the structure of S1 and S2, but potentially the reoccurrence of some structural state of the system that appears again and again over the 12 hours. Well, I say again and again three times. So these are just some findings to show that you know, the behavior as classified by the calls being made of your system you know, aren't just static over the 12 hours. You can see a decent amount of variability and fluctuation of what's going on. Um, but not only that, but we can classify these into specific states based on the structural characteristics of the system. Um, and just to add a little bit, you know, a little bit of breadcrumbs at the end, we also looked at one other thing, or at least one thing that I'll show you here, which is we looked at the response time, the average response time of persistent calls within the system across the 12 hours. So persistent calls are calls that are made every window for the full 12 hours. The reason why we only looked at these is we didn't want to introduce you know, confounding by specific calls that only uh, specific, uh, can only be found at specific windows that have inherently higher or lower response times. When we did this, you can see that we found you know, it generally fluctuates around 1.8 milliseconds of response time for all of these calls. But we see three you know, fairly obvious dips in this response time. And when we line these up with the appearance of our S3 state that we identified, you'll find that it lines up fairly well. So we don't actually know why this is. You know, we've reached out to Alibaba. We don't know any specific details because it's an anonymized data set. But you know, it adds some intrigue into the fact that we can identify states of the system. The states of the system are variable. And potentially, the appearance of some of these states or structures have some implication for the performance or the running of the system itself. So that was sort of just a very quick overview. Um, if anyone's ever interested, um, some longer findings will be published alongside the NOMS proceedings later this year. Um, I'm here to answer a few questions now otherwise, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Any questions in the room? Come on. So that was a admittedly very brief but interesting overview of what you found in the data. Yeah. Are there any particular questions that you went in trying to find answers to? You know, did, did you have uh, a topic or a task or a something you were looking for as opposed to just, you know, finding trends? Yeah. So one of the things that we're most interested in is something that I think is talked about a lot in sort of the chaos engineering approach put forward by Netflix, which is not treating these very complex, very large interconnected systems as simple systems, but as actual complex systems as defined in literature. Um, and I won't get into details onto what complex systems are, but one of the things that they do display are state changes, and so they will see stable states, and these will change and have state changes, and you can sometimes characterize these with you know, changes in the system itself. You know, these are investigated a lot in you know, fight the financial world, in geology for earthquakes and things like this. Obviously, this is very blue sky, but we wanted to see whether or not there was any interesting sort of shifting in the behavior of the system, or if it was just very static, and you see the same thing every single minute for the full operation. So that's kind of what we were going in looking at. Yeah. Any other questions? Dave, anything? Uh, nothing from uh, Ramon. Uh, then thank you very much. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, I didn't see you. So did you find any? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, so it's hard. The problem, one of the problems with complex systems is there's no one definition for, oh, we found this, this is a complex system. Obviously, we showed that we can classify blocks of persistent characteristics, um, and these could be grouped into their own states. <laughs> but it's the sort of thing where you have to keep collecting clues, and you know, this is the first sort of clue that something might be going on. Hopefully, by a few more clues time, we'll have a more strong case to be like, look, guys, this is something that should be looked at or investigated as a complex system. We tried using some kind of like statistical causality to look across states from different services? We haven't. Okay. This is a good question. We haven't. So this is very early because obviously um, thank you. it's hard to deal with these data sets, but thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's, it's a good point that, that you know, we haven't. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Jules.